Learn from today's most innovative brands and observe how they empower employees, engage consumers, design products, and co-create experiences together. Welcome to the Brand Lab series from AE Marketing Group. Hi everyone, I'm Brian Walker. We're excited to have you with us. This is episode 28 of the Brand Lab series podcast, broadcasting from 1871 Chicago, where each Tuesday we explore today's most innovative brands alongside today's most insightful executives and entrepreneurs. This week, I'm excited to have back with us Russ Klein. Russ is the CEO of the American Marketing Association, and we're gonna be talking about brand transformation. And with that said, let's enter the Brand Lab. So I'm excited to welcome Russ back. Uh, Russ was with us for a prior episode and uh, was so compelling that we wanted to bring him back and, and talk about a different topic. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with him, um, he's been an icon in the industry for many, many years. Uh, Adweek had named him the advertiser of the decade in the 2000s. He was really a pioneer in some of the early digital marketing efforts of that decade. He's also been dubbed the flamethrower uh, for some of his very provocative ideas around challenging the status quo in marketing. Super thrilled to have you back, Russ. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Brian. So you have incredible experience, both from a business and a brand perspective. Uh, as we touched on real briefly in our first conversation, that includes a lot of turnarounds. And that's a thing that often scares a lot of marketers because trying to turn a brand that's struggling around is probably one of the hardest jobs a marketer could have. But what about that excites you? Yes. Well, I have to say, uh, I w w began to wonder throughout my career if uh, there ever was such a thing as a job that wasn't a turnaround <laughs> assignment. Uh, maybe they just all came my way uh, <laughs> over the course of my career. But I had the good fortune to uh, work for a uh, gentleman who is now passed, uh, John Albers, who was the chairman and CEO of Dr. Pepper 7-Up, who believed in me at the age of 29 to make me the CMO there. And uh, I clearly was not as qualified as 10,000 other people uh, who could have, uh, have gone into that job. But John believed in me and he saw something in me. And uh, the uh, Dr. Pepper 7-Up uh, business was one that was in somewhat dire straits. Uh, Philip Morris had just sold off the 7-Up brand after years of frustration and failure to grow that business. And John gave me some advice early on. He said, Russ, turnarounds are not about turning around brands. They're about turning around people. And uh, that always stuck with me in that, you know, we have our heads down on the spreadsheets and on the documents and on the research and the customer data and so forth. And we think that there's a puzzle there that we're going to solve uh, intellectually, uh, which of course is a key part of the job. But John's point was that it's through people uh, that you will generate change, and it's through people then that you know you can create new outcomes. And uh, you know, over time, I've accumulated a number of uh, other beliefs and principles around change management, which is really the underlying theme to a turnaround. You know, the concept is, uh, of course, that if uh, the business is experiencing a, a negative trajectory, uh, there's no reason to believe that um, a trend isn't going to continue to be a trend until something changes. Uh, so uh, the question is, what is the right change? Uh, change can just be motion or it can be progress. And so identifying the way forward and doing that through people, um, again, through inspiration is the only way I know uh, to do that. And so I found just change management to be a fascinating and probably why I wound up involved in so many turnarounds. I love the Dr. Pepper analogy because, uh, you know, John trusting you uh, with that leadership role, the way the brand was, and the fact that you were 29 years old, that's what's so interesting is obviously as marketers now, what do you hear so much about millennials, millennials, millennials? So uh, you were really ahead of the curve to be 29 year old CMO. So that, you know, that says a lot. And you've talked a lot already about culture and talent and, and empowerment. So. Uh, that's really great. Now, now let's flash forward just a couple years uh, to the AMA now. So uh, with the American Marketing Association, I also think it's interesting because you've had also some backgrounds with Burger King and other franchise-related brands. 
you know, the American Marketing Association is ginormous. It's, it's a large national organization, but it also has a lot of regional chapters. Uh, so talk about how you've been realigning and kind of transforming that brand over the last two years. It's been exciting to watch from the sidelines. Oh, thank you. So it's interesting. Um, you're right. Uh, I've worked on a lot of brands, whether it be soft drinks, where there's distributor networks, uh, 7-Eleven, where there are franchisees, uh, a number of QSR uh, brands with uh, franchise networks. And I describe all those models uh, as models that have a plurality of power. Uh, uh, there's the so-called headquarters or parent company. And then, as you've uh, described in the model, is this whole other tier of of, of critical stakeholders that without their alignment, you cannot get things done. And I certainly learned in that uh, model, uh, one of my mottos was that the, that the store manager trumps the brand manager every time. And uh, that it is not enough to have a great idea at the headquarters of the operation. If you cannot inspire alignment at the front line where that experience is being delivered, and I've seen great ideas turned into uh, nothing, end up going nowhere because of lack of alignment, and I've seen mediocre ideas uh, around which people were all lined up and ready to go execute, uh, create real business results. So the power of that alignment, the valuing of all the stakeholders in your ecosystem is an uh, important insight that I certainly brought with me to the AMA. And as a result, I took an outside-in approach. The first 18 months on the job, uh, as I come up to my two-year anniversary here in a few weeks, I probably hit 50 different cities uh, spending time with stakeholders so that I could return to them with what they told me was needed. And I described it as a stakeholder built plan, uh, saying, I hope you recognize this plan because you contributed to it. And I saw a lot of nodding heads, of course, saying, that's what we said, that's what we need, and so now we're on board. And uh, uh, again, that to me is the way you enroll and build alignment, is through a lot of elbow grease, uh, if you will, in terms of stakeholder management. And uh, you know, sometimes uh, too much stakeholder management can be distracting, right? Uh, and uh, so I call that sometimes friction costs, right? If you're spending more than a day a week on stakeholder management, I think then you're starting to incur maybe friction costs. But probably 20% of your time uh, in any given week uh, should be spent on making sure that not just do I have the right ideas, but do I have all the people needed to agree that this is the right idea on board? And throughout that journey, which I'm sure in some ways feels like it's flown by the last almost two years, in other ways it's probably felt like dog years, uh, talk about uh, maybe a bump in the road and how you guys kind of work together uh, to overcome that. Well, I would say that when you are in a state of transformation, which the AMA is right now, we have bumps in the road every day. Uh, and uh, the way to um, navigate them is to face them, acknowledge them as reality, try to bring an alignment around uh, you know, what I call dissatisfaction. One of the pieces of learning that I picked up along the way uh, from uh, Michael Beers at Harvard Business School on organizational behavior is that change uh, equals a vision times a strategy times D. And uh, D stands for dissatisfaction. And the reason he has multiplication signs in there is that the best vision, the best strategy, without universal dissatisfaction with the way things are now, is going to be multiplied times zero, and therefore there'll be no change. And so building a common understanding, a common awareness of, hey, the way things are right now are not satisfactory. And so if we can agree to that, then we can engage uh, into solutions collectively. One of the other concepts I've always loved, too, is this idea of the, the bystander effect. You know, when you're in the middle of a transformation, uh, I'm sure some of our older listeners would know about the Kitty Genovese story in New York in the 60s, who was uh, a victim of a murder, a vicious murder, uh, of which there were 38 people who supposedly listened to and in some cases observed the crime in action and did not call the police. Now, there was no 911 back then, but you could still call the police. And that then became named the, uh, the bystander effect. And the idea of it was that uh, 
that the more people who think there are others able to solve the solution, the more likely they are to, to think that someone else will make the call and that they don't need to. And so, you know, what I've uh, shared a, on occasion with folks is that if the bystander effect can result in the death of a human being, it can result in the death of an organization. And so let's all be active. Let's all not assume that, you know, someone else is going to do something. If you see something, not only just say something, but do something about it. And so we're, these are, again, teachable lessons around, I think, um, a, an environment that is that where the mandate is transformation and change management is is something that's going on every day that's so close to my own heart because 20 years ago when i graduated college i wrote my senior thesis on bystander conformity <laughs> uh so and anna and many people that are with me will hear me talk about that quite a bit actually the bystander conformity mentality so Really interesting perspective on, on some of the evolution of the AMA with you and your leadership team and, and your stakeholders throughout the last two years. Let's look just broader inside the industry. What's a recent uh, kind of brand that you've noticed that you feel maybe was on a downward trend or maybe fell out of vogue with consumers? But what's a, what's a brand that you see is kind of doing a good job of either transforming in our, our digital era or maybe is kind of reinventing itself? Well, I can't think of a brand that, that jumps out at me who, who uh, there are a lot of brands out there that are doing a great job who have come onto the scene, you know, brands like Uber, uh, uh, Amazon. My observation about that is, is how profoundly brands like that are changing expectations across all categories. You know, uh, marketers used to look inside their own space and say, well, here's the gold standard for customer satisfaction. Now the gold standard are these transcendent concepts that have become part of pop culture, like Uber, like Amazon. And, and people expect a frictionless experience uh, uh, in every respect. If they are getting it on Uber, they expect it on United Airlines. They expect it, you know, uh, elsewhere, regardless of whether the airline industry thinks that they have a different set of standards. Uber and Amazon and others like them uh, are changing the expectation, you know, for, for customers out there. Uh, I think uh, also that, again, the, we talked about digitization in the modern enterprise. What I think is really exciting is what is sort of like a tip of the iceberg, which there is so much more to come around turning dumb products into smart products out there, uh, particularly on the industrial side with the use of sensors. And when you think about how intelligent products, both at an industrial and a consumer level, are going to become in service to our society, uh, the opportunities are just are so exciting. And uh, that's what kind of catches my attention. And do you see something along the lines of co-creation being a great opportunity to help organizations transform not just from a brand, but from a business and a digital perspective today? Uh, absolutely. Uh, there's work by a um, prominent academic uh, in the marketing community, VK Kumar, uh, who uh, has written a book around uh, profitable customer engagement recently. It's a great uh, read uh, and great insights around what really constitutes customer engagement. And he basically will define that, that a, an engaged customer is a customer who not only gives value back to the brand uh, directly through a transaction, through money, but then also indirectly by uh, getting involved in the brand through word of mouth, uh, feedback, blogs, uh, shares, likes, uh, all of those sort of co-creation uh, uh, dynamics. And that, a, that there is no such thing as, as a, a, a customer engagement with a brand until both of those factors are at work uh, for a brand. So this idea of co-creation is, is an important part of engagement. Um, I used to say that a brand is the, is the promise plus the experience, and I've revised my equation to say a brand is the story plus the experience, uh, because now that story is not just the story the company tells. That story is the, the story that is co-created uh, by its customer and by the consuming public. And that story plus that experience now becomes what a brand is and whether or not it actually represents a, an engaged relationship with a customer. 
totally agree. I think it's absolutely critical for today's brands to give customers, and in some cases, maybe even non-customers, a seat at the design table so that they can work together to create new products or services or experiences. And I think that gets to a little bit of a of a tug of war right now with today's marketers, especially in the C-suite, and that is around the customer experience. You talked about that real briefly in our last episode, and you, you just had a great analogy, I think, with between technology and brands like Uber and Amazon, the expectation game has been raised so high. Uh, anybody with a smartphone now is a critic, uh, an author, a photojournalist. Consumers have so much power, and by default, sometimes there's this question of should experience live within the CMO uh, vertical? Uh, I'm curious what responsibility or role you think marketers should have with customer experience today. Well, I, I think there are some business models where a customer experience can uh, be placed in, from an organizational chart standpoint, can be placed uh, under the CMO. But I think um, most models, just out of inertia, are always going to have some part of the customer experience that sits outside the CMO's direct reporting uh, uh, structure. But again, that doesn't mean that the CMO can't be a source uh, of orchestration, a source of design uh, influence, a source of insight uh, into that experience so that other uh, individuals uh, at the C-suite responsible for delivering that experience um, are aligned in making sure that it is, it's a co- coherent and, and cohesive one. Uh, you know, it's easy to say, well, you know, since I'm, I'm the CMO, uh, our organization should be customer centric, so therefore everything should report to me, right? Uh, I don't think that's realistic. Uh, there are certain uh, aspects of, um, uh, of a business model where I think healthy tensions actually lead to better work. Uh, and so long as the CEO is encouraging those healthy tensions and is keeping the organization focused on the customer, they will result in better uh, work product, better um, innovation, uh, and a better customer experience. Yeah, it seems like some of the secret sauce is obviously uh, setting the right tone from a leadership and culture perspective. Because as you talked about earlier, uh, you can have a leadership team talk about being customer centric, but if your frontline workers uh, are not customer centric, they're the ones that are interacting with the consumers, and those are the ones that are going to really be at the front lines of your brand. So uh, that's really interesting. As we start to wind down, um, we talked uh, about a, a number of things with your background with brand transformation. I'd like to pivot just a little bit. Uh, along the lines of transformation, but more from like a leadership perspective. You know, obviously I knew who you were before I met you today. You're, you're very famous. You've got an incredible track record of work in the industry. Uh, one of the things though that I loved is this notion that at one point you transformed from a flamethrower to a torchbearer. Uh, and I'd love for you to just expand upon that just a little bit in terms of of that journey is someone who myself is a little older actually in his marketing career. Uh, talk about like the flamethrower and the torchbearer and what that means to you. Well, uh, I, I, the flamethrower language came, I think, from uh, Ad Week or, or some uh, industry publication, um, and it uh, stemmed from a lot of the uh, work uh, we were doing at the time at Burger King, which was uh, viewed as uh, provocative and uh, controversial. And, uh, you know, when I uh, came into the organization, the uh, brand was on seven straight years of negative uh, sales, and so it was in a dire state. Uh, I was fortunate to have an amazing board and a, a CEO who really empowered me to just do something and, uh, and act. And managerial courage was valued in the organization. Uh, and that's what I really loved most because uh, uh, I was asked a question on a panel the other day about whether or not uh, the best ideas out there are actually getting to the market. And uh, I think I shocked some people, maybe disappointed them when I said, I, I don't. I don't think the best ideas are getting uh, to the market. Now, we see many that do, uh, but I would contend that there are um, uh, many times more uh, that have ended up on conference room floors or editing room floors because uh, someone was unwilling to uh, take a stand. Uh, you know, I don't think you can inspire if you don't take a stand now and then. 
uh, and uh, have the managerial courage to uh, to take a point of view for a brand. And so that's kind of what was underneath, I think, that label of flamethrower, which was just to me being true to your principles, being willing to take a stand, um, and, and having the managerial courage to in, to weather the you know all that came with you know uh, making a principled uh, decision and and. Um, of course, a lot of what we did was ushering in uh, digital uh, advertising with our partners at Crispin Porter Bogusky back in the early uh, 2000s. Um, moving to the torchbearer role uh, from Flamethrower, uh, for me, has been an adjustment because my responsibilities now, I think, require that the flame itself uh, maybe be not burning quite as hot, uh, but that it's um, somehow brighter um, and um, it's a slower burn, you know, uh, and uh, it because the responsibility is to take a brand and a community that's been around for almost 80 years and ensure that it's around for another 80 and that it stays relevant. Um, and so the visioning, I think, has been maybe more important uh, in, in the role that I'm now playing. Uh, and um, again, the ability to put our stakeholders and our customers in that vision so they can see themselves in it. Um, and that's where, you know, the torch is really about uh, providing a broader light for the community, whereas uh, Flamethrower had more to do, I think, with my managerial behavior and some of my decisions in, in the past. Well, as we wrap up, I want to talk about kind of a different light. Uh, you know, as we've talked about, uh, you're very well known in the industry. You've done tremendous work. Uh, one of the things I did not know about you is is some of the great charitable work you do. And you talked about lights. You talked about community. Uh, that's something that's been critical to us in the six years that I started uh, AE Marketing Group. We've been involved with 28 non-for-profits here in Chicago, nationally, globally, because uh, I think it's important to give back when you do well, and, and that's just good for the community. Um, I loved reading a little bit about um, a Mother's Love Foundation. That really oh. touched me, uh, and I thought, wow, that, that says a lot that someone who's been so successful has thought about giving back to others. Uh, talk about why that's important to you. You surprised me with uh, your knowledge of that, and I, I appreciate the, the question. Uh, my father died when I was two years old, and so my mother... Uh, raised my brothers and I while being a working woman. And uh, she inherited a family-owned business in Cleveland, Ohio that was a steel company. Uh, so you can imagine in the uh, early 60s, a woman having to step into the breach in a steel company in Cleveland. Uh, and uh, she got bumped around uh, and bruised around uh, uh, a bit. And I used to watch, you know, her come home uh, after those uh, long days, uh, you know, knowing what she was sacrificing uh, for us. And so I was a, a latchkey kid, I guess, uh, was described in the day. And uh, uh, so it just always um, uh, stuck with me, you know, the sacrifice that she made. And uh, when I uh, had the chance uh, to do something at a point in my career, I decided to honor my mother and, uh, and create a, a foundation at Ohio State University that I uh, endowed. And it produces uh, scholarships each year for students uh, who come from uh, families with working moms, uh, you know, uh, single parent homes. And um, it was just a, a way for me to sort of, you know, keep alive uh, uh, honoring that sacrifice. Uh, well, I didn't mean to surprise you, but uh, I just think that that was such a wonderful story from, you know, all the headlines that you read and, uh, about your career through the Wall Street Journal, Ad Week, all that stuff to kind of see a little bit more. I think it speaks a lot to you as a man and as a leader. And uh, um, we certainly would like to try to support that cause as well. So, Russ, thank you so much for being on the Brand Lab series. Thank you for coming to 1871, sharing your incredible experience, insight, and wisdom with fellow executives across many industries. So thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you, Brian. I want to thank our listeners for joining us in the Brand Lab today and to invite you back next Tuesday as we continue our journey of today's most innovative brands as we learn how they empower employees, engage consumers, design products, and co-create experiences together. Until next time. Hi, this is Russ Klein, CEO of the American Marketing Association. I hope you'll check out what's happening at AMA.org called The Marketplace where you'll find smarter, more useful content, connect with other marketers, 
Find out what's next in the industry and supercharge your career. To listen to our other Brand Lab Series podcast episodes, visit iTunes, Google Play, or BrandLabSeries.com. Follow us on Twitter at Brand Lab Series. And if you have any questions or ideas for a future Brand Lab Series podcast, email us at info at BrandLabSeries.com. <laughs>